Good morning. Today is Friday, September 4th. Ah, may the 4th be with you. Um, it, it, AD 2020, this is uh, my Friday video lesson. Now, I am going to be efficient, and I am going to combine this video lesson for both my ancient and medieval classes and my honors class, uh, and my European history class. So there is one video that you all will be sharing. Now, my European history kids are a little ahead of certain things. So on the description, I am going to place the timestamp that you can skip ahead to, to avoid some of the things that you've already heard about essay writing and also about um, the uh, class policies in here, which I'm going to go over with the ancient kids. Ancient and medieval students, you need to watch all of it. So that is the plan. First, we're not in person, so I can get really close. Not that you ever want to see that again. You're too young to experience that much pain. Um, okay. General expectations, and, and then I'll tell you to skip ahead, uh, European students. Just to be clear, uh, I will be live streaming almost every class. On those days where I'm going to be showing a movie in class, uh, to the live students, and uh, then I will try to have an al analog or link to that movie for the people at home. And I will make a special announcement to that effect in advance or at the latest by the beginning of class time. Otherwise, you should be looking for the live stream. But remember, we've had all sorts of technology problems. So it's entirely possible that you will be... Um, yeah, I guess that's the best it's going to be. That you will be looking uh, at the lesson later, either by looking at another classroom's live stream or by looking at the YouTube videos that I'm making to back up the live stream. It's annoying and obnoxious and it takes more time, but it's the best I can do. I will also remind you that I expect you to learn everything I teach, whether it's in person, through a live stream, or through a video uh, like the one I'm making today. And if you don't understand something, I expect you to write it down and bring in questions. And uh, so those are sort of general things. Now, European history students, feel free to skip ahead. <clears throat> I won't do that again. That was stupid. Ancient and medieval students. I quickly went over the essay portion of your chapter survey yesterday. I want to make sure that you understand it. So I'm going to start with that, and then I'm going to go through class policies, and then we'll get to today's uh, history part. It shouldn't take that long. So ancient and medieval students should be going to the syllabus packet, which looks like this. See, it says syllabus on it. And you go to the chapter survey, which looks like this. And you flip to the second side of the chapter survey, which looks like <clears throat> this. The second side of the chapter survey. At least it covers my ugly bug. That's what we're going to be talking about right now. You will notice that there are sections for three essays. I went over this quickly yesterday. I'm going over a little more slowly today to make sure you understand. The first essay is a, an essay that you choose from the eight that are in the section Questions for Critical Thought. The second essay is another that you choose from the eight essay questions in the Baker workbook, Questions for Critical Thought. And the third essay is from the eight questions in the Analyzing Primary Source Documents section of the Baker Workbook chapter section. So you get to pick two out of eight from Questions for Critical Thought and one out of eight for, uh, from the section that deals with uh, analyzing primary source documents. This choice should allow you 
to write essays that you have some interest in. If you're not interested in writing it, no one's going to be interested in reading it. So choose essays that interest you, or at least that don't repel you, and try to do the best you can. Normally, essays are wide open to your creativity and your insights and your unique individual approach, and that's great for self-expression, and that's great for playing around with your writing style and ideas. But history essays are a bit less freeform. All good history essays have four qualities. These qualities include a thesis, a rationale logically explaining the reasons why you believe in your thesis argument, evidence, which is information from history relating to why your thesis is valid, and significance, why does it matter in broad terms, what big, what's the big deal? How does it relate to us? How does it relate to the study of human history? How does it matter and why? You have to overtly have all four of these sections in every essay that you write for me on a chapter survey. All four. So, Yesterday, I quickly went through the question of what was the biggest factor in the fall of the Roman Republic. That's the question. I won't necessarily start with my thesis, because I won't necessarily know what my opinion is answering that. But what the thesis will do it will, is it will argue a point of view. So the thesis is not the place for, well, there's a little truth on all sides of... No! You argue a single unitary point of view. You argue that unitary point of view because that argument is going to give life and purpose to what you write. You are arguing something, advocating a point of view, trying to sell an idea. You're trying to do it honestly. You're trying to do it fairly, you're trying to do it reasonably, but you have a dog in this race. You are trying to sell an idea. So the thesis is going to give a clear answer. The rationale, the rationale is the reason why you think your thesis is valid. You're explaining it in reasonable, logical terms. The evidence is stuff from history that you can say, see, this event demonstrates the validity of my thesis. That event proves that my thesis is valid. This other event may be the exception that proves the rule. You're using evidence related to your thesis. And finally, significance. Why does it matter to the broader period of Roman history? Why does it matter to us? What does it say about humanity? What is the connection between this event and the big picture of human history, human nature, and the human condition. So if the question is, por qué, why, or what was the biggest factor in the fall of the Roman Republic? See, I'm saying it slower than I did yesterday, hoping that that slowness will help you absorb and understand what I'm saying. So I start with the evidence. I know you haven't studied Roman history yet. It's okay. The first bit of evidence is that winning the Punic Wars against Carthage and other wars against Greece filled Roman lands with slaves. Captured prisoners of war in ancient times became slaves. So these slaves were bought in place of freeman workers. Family farms closed down, small businesses closed down, and what were left were huge plantations called latifundia, and what were left were massive uh, companies in the cities that were run by the super-rich senatorial class or, or the equiates, the, uh, the knights uh, of the Roman society. What that really meant was that average men couldn't support their families which is a scary proposition, and they became more and more dependent upon the handouts of the wealthy and the powerful. Their freedom 
became a travesty of what it had been. That's the first bit of evidence. So you can just put slaves ruin the economy for free men. It's a bullet point. You can use bullet points in evidence. Second, uh, two tribunes, Gaius and Tri Tiberius Gracchus, two brothers, are political leaders who offer a solution, which is a redistribution of super huge estates to get people back onto small family farms. Now, this solution is very controversial because it threatens private property rights within the Roman Republic, and private property rights are a huge deal. So this is a political debate, which is fine. It would have been resolved through normal political means. But the senators who opposed the Gracchi, the Gaius and Tiberius Gracchus, decided, eh, kill him instead. So they arranged for mob violence, and Gaius and Tiberius Gracchus, each in their succession, was murdered in front of hundreds of witnesses by clients that were known to serve these rich senators. Now, had the Roman system still worked, those senators would have been connected to this case, they would have been put on trial, and they would have been executed for premeditated conspiracy to murder. But no! By this point, the political system is so corrupt that the Romans don't try any of the senators who ordered the deaths of the Gracchi, and at best, they get a few flunkies that were thugs in the crowd that did some of the beating. What that means is that political violence is now on the table. If it were 2020, instead of having uh, Biden and Trump debate and having us vote on who should be president, just get the supporters of one to assassinate the other, and we'll call it good. If you allow political violence and assassination to succeed, you can kiss your freedom, your voting, goodbye. And that's what happened in Rome. So, the first thing, slaves ruin the economy for free men. The second bullet point, uh, the assassination of the Gracchi goes unpunished. The third bit of evidence from history is rich men began uh, acquiring private armies. Guys like Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla were Roman wealthy men, who at times of emergency were granted the power to buy the equipment for the troops in an army that would be loyal to them. You see, up until now, Roman soldiers were Roman citizens who had to pay for their own gear. The rich actually served in the front line of battle because it was more dangerous because they could afford a full suit of armor. But not anymore. Now, rich men will hire you to be a soldier. And even though you may march under a banner that says, Senatus Populusque Roma, in fact, it's, it's not the Senate and people of Rome that you serve. You serve the guy who pays your check every week or every month. So there's a crisis. Rome's armies are away. Rome is threatened by barbarians. Marius is given the ability to raise an army from poor people. And their loyalty is to Marius, not to the Republic. Later, Sulla is given the same ability. He builds his own private army, loyal to him, not to the Republic. Then they start fighting. So the third thing, after slaves ruin the economy and after the assassination of the Gracchi goes unpunished, the third thing is the wealthy start getting private armies. Or you could say Marius and Sulla start getting private armies. Marius and Sulla. Okay, the fourth bit of evidence is these private armies start fighting in civil wars. And these civil wars go on and on. Finally, the Roman people get behind one of the winners of the late last civil wars, a guy named Octavian, who then takes on the title of Augustus, which means man of destiny, and uh, they, they proclaim him emperor. And they're basically saying, here, take care of us, keep us safe, no more civil war. So that's the evidence. I know, I know, I know, you don't know this yet. I'm trying to give you an example. So I'm saying a bunch of stuff that you don't know yet, but I hope I'm saying it slow enough today to be scrutable and understandable and something that you at least get the idea about. So that's the evidence. I've got four or five bits of evidence in bullet point form. Now I go to my thesis. And my thesis is 
Dictators didn't steal Romans' freedoms. Romans gave those freedoms away in return for security. Dictators didn't steal Romans' freedoms. The Romans gave their freedoms away in return for security. That's my thesis. My rationale, the reasoning that explains my thesis as valid and connects it to the evidence. The Roman economy prevented average people from supporting themselves. Those average people become dependent upon the rich who are corrupted by this power. The rich then start killing their enemies and getting away with it. They start buying their own armies and waging war to control everyone. And they're allowed to do this. This brings anarchy and chaos and suffering throughout the Roman world as these rich men compete to become dictator for life, or consul for life, or impeditor, he who commands. Finally, after over 50 years of this, there's a winner to a civil war. He's Caesar's nephew, Octavian. And the Roman people get behind him and say, to heck with the Republic, take care of us, big daddy, keep us safe. And Augustus says, certainly, by the way, you're still free. They're not. But he makes them plausible lies. He keeps the Senate around that does whatever he wants. He keeps the consuls around and the other vestiges of the Republic. But they do basically what Augustus tells them. Why? Because Augustus controls the military. And Augustus is very wealthy. Big Daddy Augustus is given all the power. So what has happened because of this? is 50 years of civil war lead the people to say the heck with freedom, it's a waste of time, give us control, security, stability, law and order. Right now in the world, the Chinese Communist Party is gambling that their mode of government is better than ours, that freedom is too chaotical and anarchic and easily to be met, easy to be messed with, and that their form of totalitarian, authoritarian dictatorship, where everything is controlled by the leaders and the party, is going to win out over free societies like ours. Well, what happened with the fall of the Republic is that that played out. A free people gave up their freedom. So a summary of all that is the people of Rome couldn't support themselves. The wealthy of Rome began assassinating one another and preventing the justice system from, being, from, from working and punishing them. The uh, wealthy began to raise personal armies and fight civil wars for control. After 50 years of this chaos, the people of Rome gave up on their freedom and begged Augustus to take care of them, and he said yes. That's my rationale. Vocabulary. Find two things, two words or proper names that you don't recognize, the, list them, and quickly define them. That's easy. Finally, significance. Why does it matter? We are based on Rome. Our founding fathers looked at a hundred years of chaotic Athenian democracy in Greece and said, No, they are not our model. We are not a democracy. They looked at 500 years of uh, successful Republican Rome plus, and they said, yes, this is what we want to do. We want to model ourselves against uh, after Rome's Republic. So our systems of, po uh, of political balance uh, and all the things you learned in civics is based on Rome. Ideas that come from the Roman Republic always have multiple people in charge of things. Never trust any one person with too much power because the seduction to become king will become overwhelming. So, Rome is our cultural and political ancestor. And what that means is we're like in a family. Now, every family has their own medical problems that are inherited. They're part of the genetics. My family uh, on my father's side tends to have weak eyesight and male pattern baldness. So even though I'm blind in my left eye because of an accident when I was a baby, my right eye doesn't see very well either because of the weak eyesight on my father's side. Also, my father's side tends to have men lose their hair at a fairly young age. 
I began losing my hair a little bit in high school. Um, other, you know, other families have cancer in their background or leukemia in their background, or they have some tendency to certain kinds of bone diseases or whatever. Every family has genetic weaknesses. Well, since we're part of Rome's family, if the Roman people suffered enough chaos so that they were willing to give up their freedom in return for being taken care of by big daddy government, it can happen to us. And by the way, those people who are sowing riot and insurrection in our streets know it. And they wouldn't be the first people in American history to calculate that if you cause enough chaos, the people will give up on the constant tensions of being free and all the responsibility and all the worry, and they will demand that somebody come in, step in and take control. And that will be the end of freedom. I'm not saying that every rioter or every peaceful protester, and there are a few of them, are doing this. I'm saying that some of the people behind this mob violence understand that it could lead to something more than simply improving this or that as regards to the police and as to regards to the black community and as regards to crime and how criminals deal with the police or how accused deal with the police. It could lead some of these people hope to revolution. And believe me, when you have a free society that undergoes revolution, what's going to replace it won't be freedom. So, that's what it has to do. So that is an example of how to do an essay. I'm a history teacher, and I know this stuff, so I go on and on. All you have to do is pick a topic and have, as part of your answer, evidence, thesis, rationale, vocabulary, and significance. And you just put them on that piece of paper in the boxes provided. You can use bullet points for evidence. You have a listing of the vocab words and their definitions in vocab. You should write in normal English paragraphs for the, um, for the, um, uh, the rationale and the significance. And your thesis statement should be a simple declarative sentence, which is your answer. You're arguing a point of view. You're not arguing a fact. You're arguing a point of view about the fact. That is the heart of a thesis. You're arguing a point of view about the fact. So that's the essay. Next. Please go to the fourth page side in your syllabus pack, and you will see the class policies. Class policies are the, they start with that sheet that you tore your signature tab for off of, so the class policy sheet are in your syllabus pack, just like the uh, chapter survey. And the first page of the class policies looks like this. And this includes the signature sheet, which you've probably already cut off and had signed, or, or which you will be doing this weekend. I'm going to go over these quickly so that we're all on the same page. And once I'm done with that, we are mostly through with the rules, and we're going to get to the history. My class starts with a warning label, because we will talk about controversial things. I will tell you what I think, not what's real, but what I think. You tell me what you think, we'll have a discussion. I will also teach history, and I'll try to be clear about when I'm being a teacher professing my knowledge, and when we're talking about opinion, in which case your opinion and my opinion have effectively equal validity, because everyone's got opinions, like almost everyone's got noses. Next page. There's the grading scale for Coeur d'Alene Charter Academy. There is, uh, if I just put an A, B, C, D uh, on your paper, or with a plus or a minus next to it, maybe what percentage you're going to get for that. What grades mean? A's are good. F's are bad. A's good. F's bad. Try to get A's. Try not to get F's. Now, understand, it is fairly easy for anyone who works hard to pass my course. It is, however, not easy at all to get an A. So, if you really want to work hard and get an A, then do your work on time, ask questions if you have them, work hard and get an A. Uh, hard work will almost always compensate for uh, problems. Um, grading proportions. 30% are quizzes, I'm sorry, are exams and major projects. I have four or five major exams throughout the year spaced out, each for, 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 for a unit. 
Um, and they are big and they, ca they count as a lot. Uh, another major project is the case study, which we'll talk about. You've got one per quarter. 30% um, of your grade is quizzes and minor projects. Uh, that is um, anything that I may spring on you. I don't tell you about quizzes in advance. I feel justified asking you to take a quiz anytime I want. Because what I'm trying to do is give you a sense of uh, responsibility, and I'm also trying to test what you actually happen to know at a given moment without testing how good a test prepper you are. How much you actually know in your mind as opposed to how much you can cram in before an exam. Now, there are some quizzes you can pretty much predict. For example, when you do your chapter survey one, which is the 21st or the 22nd of September, you will probably have a quiz on chapter one, either on the 21st or the 22nd or sometime close to that. Because I believe in testing what you've learned about a chapter that you just turned in homework about. So be prepared for that. Don't worry, there are ways you can improve your quizzes if you tend to be worried about it. We'll talk. The third 30% of your grade is classwork and homework. The fourth category, 10% of your grade, is attitude, preparedness, and participation. Basically, if you show up every day with the right attitude, try your best, do your best, not perfect, just your best, uh, you should have something significant that helps your grade. And the 10% of the quarterly grade can help determine, you know, turn an A into an A plus or turn a C minus into a C or whatever. So that's what you get. And then it lists out daily expectations. Read it, but you're all students. You know what being a good student is. Be a good student. Now, to be clear, everyone has bad days. For example, my wife has chosen to put up with me since January of 1985. We've been married since July of 1990. So she is patient and calm and odd because she chooses to put up with me. She's also an amazing worker. And one day in the mid nineties, it all came together. Tuesday evening, I got a call. There was a family emergency. Suddenly I needed to leave Maine and travel a thousand miles west to upstate New York near the uh, Ohio border. So, I travel a thousand miles starting at 3 a.m. Wednesday, that Wednesday morning, the next day. At that time, her car was more reliable and new than mine. So we switched cars. I made arrangements to be off work for a few days. I got in her car and I drove off. That morning at 5.30 or so, she woke up and got ready to work. But there was an additional wrinkle because we had arranged for our two cats to get flea dipped. Now, we were new to that area of Maine, so we had to take the recommendations of one of her co-workers as to a good place to get that done. So, first thing she's got to do is get the cats into the kitty carriers. And they don't want to go because kitty carriers equal drives, and they don't like drives, and equals the vet, and they don't like the vet. Finally, she crams them both into their own kitty carriers and puts them in the car. Gets her stuff ready, and she's going to drive to the flea dip place. But we live in Maine, so everything is an hour away. So, for 45 minutes through the Maine woods, <laughs> the cats are meowing and moaning at the top of their lungs, exuding liquid from every single orifice, and saying in catties, We hate you, Mom Cat. You're doing this just to hurt us. We'll remember this, and we blame you. And Tina is sensitive enough to have her feelings hurt about something like that. But she does it. She drives there. She takes the kitty carriers out and walks into the place. And the smell that hits her is foul. And the waiting room is filthy. And she decides, snap judgment, I wouldn't let my worst enemy's pets stay, any, stay here, let alone my pets. Turns around on her heel, goes back into the car. <laughs> 45 minutes home, gets the cats out, they go flying off, running into the far corners of the house to hide, again, 
oozing, covered in gunk, saying, we hate you, Mom Cat. But that's done. Tina telephones work, says she's sorry, she's going to be late. They say, fine, it's, it's not something that happened very often. She cleans up, gets in her car, drives an hour from where we live in the foothills of the White Mountains of Western Maine to Portland, Maine, where she works for an insurance company. She parks my car, crosses the street, goes up to the second floor, sits in her cubicle, looks out at my car because she's got a window, and starts working processing claims from some paper mills in the center of the state of Maine. She gets into the group. Work can be calming. And so she's working for an hour, an hour and a half. And then she, you know, oh, okay, things are better. She looks up at the empty space where my car was. Now, she doesn't remember what happens next. The next thing that she remembers, she's standing eyeball to eyeball with the little nebbish of a boss that she has in the center of all the cubicles in the office, shouting, I can't believe you towed my bleeping car! Because Tina bounces when she's angry. It's funny. And she didn't say bleeping. She, she used uh, adult language, salty language, bad language. The guy is terrified. And basically says, don't worry, Mr. Shinario, don't worry. We'll get your car back. Remember, we started a new policy this week. We'd tow anyone that didn't have a parking decal. I guess your husband's car didn't have a parking decal. Duh! Okay. He says they'll get the car back. No problem. She goes back to her cubicle, and the adrenaline begins to leave her system. And she says, okay, well, that's that's it for this job. I'm fired. No question. And she she begins packing up her stuff. But they don't fire her for two reasons. First, she is their best worker or one of their best workers. Second, nothing like this has ever happened before. It was a perfect storm of annoyance that just overwhelmed her self-control at that moment, and she lost it. <laughs> and they decided to just say it was a bad moment, let's move on, and, and they did. If you have a bad moment in here, because life has just given you a perfect storm of nonsense. We'll deal with it. We'll work it through. An occasional bad moment happens to everyone. I wouldn't like you to see me have one. However, you can stop it before it becomes bad. If you're in just a terrible state because of stuff going on in your world, and you know that if you listen to my voice say one more sentence about this stuff, and you just can't handle it. Raise your hand, ask to go to the office. I'll look at you, I'll think about it. I'll say yes, almost assuredly, and you can go wait outside Mr. Nikolai's office. It's not gonna be a discipline problem. It's not gonna be any kind of problem because you are taking care of business. You are trying to keep yourself under control. That's great. That's what you're supposed to do. And if we need to, we'll talk about it later and figure out things, and you'll have to make up your work. But at the very least, you won't blow up all over the classroom. This is assuming, of course, that you don't have a pattern of it. A pattern of late work, of not turned in work, of obnoxious behavior. That's not a bad day. That's a personal choice. And it is my job to discourage such bad personal choices. And we will do the dance of discipline and I will win. You should not make a pattern or a habit of losing control or of being sloppy or lazy or whatever, uh, disorganized in this room or with history or with school in general. This is your job. Try to approach it in a responsible fashion. So, Having said that, you know what you need to do. We've only got a few more minutes of this. Next page. Uh, we are on site section Roman numeral seven, acts, absences, and expectations. If you're not here, follow at home. This stuff is all online this year. It should be very easy to do that. If you're coming back, get caught up at home before class. If we're doing a quiz and you've been out for a few days, I may very well ask you to take the quiz. You'll be able to improve it, but I may ask you to take it under the assumption that you've been trying your best, your reasonable best, your reasonable best to keep current. 
If you need a little bit more time, we'll talk about it, but I would like you to be back and ready to go when you come back, and with everything online, this should be easy. I don't know we've talked about. I don't know section 8 is the beginning of an answer, but it is never the end of an answer. I don't know, but I think, but my best guess is. Uh, section 9, notes and handbooks. It is my business that you have something to write on and something to write with in front of you, and I'm telling you, you should have it at home, too. It's your business what you write down. As long as it's not giant, obscene things that are going to distract everyone in class, it's not a problem. Your notebook is for you, to help you become a better student, to help you remember things. So that you write notes is your business. What you write as notes, I'm sorry, that you write notes is my business. What you write as notes, that's your business. Um, uh, extensions. If you have a valid reason to ask for an extension, come see me as soon as possible before the due date. If I agree with you that it's a serious problem, I will write you a note saying that I'm giving you an extension on such and such an assignment. Keep that note. Staple that note to your work before you turn it in. And when you do that, I won't give you a late penalty. If something happens and you don't know until after the fact, tell me. And if I can confirm it or if it seems reasonable to me, and if you are not abusing this, then sure, I will uh, I will write you an extension. But normally, the new due date is the due date. And that brings us to section 11, uh, late work. Anything late, even if it's 15 minutes late, loses 30 points, percentage points off the top. So um, an assignment is due. I tell you the due date, it's on the syllabus, you know it, and it's due by 3 p.m. On, on a given day, and you show up at 3.30. That's late, minus 30. You show up the next morning before class. That's late, minus 30. So that means you could do a perfect job on a piece of work, but it's late, so the best grade you can get is a 70. If you do a pretty good job, you'll get a 50 or a 60, somewhere in there. So don't do your work late, but do your work on time. Still, a 70 is better than a zero, which is what you'll get if you don't turn any work in. Work that is not yet turned in. I don't have these neutral placeholders like some teachers have. If it's not turned in, it's a zero. That's it. End of story. Until you turn it in, at which point it gets a grade. And zeros are the vampires of the grading world. They will suck your blood. They will suck your grade down into the basement. Um, answering all test questions, section 13. Life does not reward you for bobbling and being indecisive. If I ask you a question on a quiz or a test, give me your best guess. If you don't know, take a shot. Who knows? You're smart. You've been paying attention. Your guess is probably better than 50-50 to be right. But don't leave anything blank. That's a cop-out, and you definitely guaranteed a wrong uh, answer. If you take a guess, it could be right. You never know. And that's a life lesson, too. Section 14. This is the most important part of your class policies. Improving quiz and exam grades. For every quiz and exam, except for the silly test and the semester final, every other quiz and exam, you can rewrite wrong answers for half credit. If I have a test question that says, blank attacked Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, and you put the Belgians, that's wrong. So on a separate sheet of paper, you will write the Japanese Empire uh, launched a sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. And you will take that paper along with all the other rewritten answers as fully correct statements, as fully correct statements. Don't just give me a bunch of letters, as fully correct statements. Staple it to the front of your old test so I can compare the two. Turn it in, and you'll get half credit. So if you earned a 30 on a, an exam, you could bring that up to a uh, 65. If you earned a 70 on the exam, you could bring it up to an 85. If you earned a 98 on the exam, you could bring it up to a 99. Heck, if you got one wrong question and you had a 99, I'll bump you up to 100 if you do a rewrite. Rewrites can save people from failing this class. They can also save people from getting grades down in the dungeon. You can actually really improve. Also, if your family wonders, why are you failing history or getting such a lousy grade? 
I don't have to say, well, I guess they're just not good at history, or I guess they're not great students, or I guess I'm just not a good fit as their teacher. No, what I'll be able to say is those things may be also true, but they can be fixed. But you know what also can be fixed? Hard work. Hard work can always compensate for weakness. Anyone, anyone, anyone can do hard work. Anyone can rewrite wrong answers for half credit. If you do that, you're helping yourself. If you don't do that and you get lousy grades, I don't think anyone is going to see your side of it. You have the option of rewriting wrong answers for half credit. Do it. Plagiarism. My titanium, adamantium, iron, steel rule of writing stands. Never claim credit for someone else's words. Always write things in your own voice. If you always write your own words in your own voice and only quote other people's words from time to time, you will be fine. If I think you're stealing words by writing like a PhD student or an encyclopedia, if I think that you and a classmate are closely paraphrasing one another, and basically it's a phrase for phrase, statement to statement, plagiarism, I will find out to my own satisfaction. I don't have to prove it in a court of law. I have to prove it to my own judgment and satisfaction. I will give you a chance to explain uh, that you know the knowledge, but if it's clear that you've plagiarized, not only will that assignment probably be turned into a zero for both people involved in the plagiarism, uh, the plagiarizer and the plagiarizee, but also likely um, I will find a way to, to give you negative points because it is bad. If you put things in your own words, it means you understand it enough. So as a teacher, I like that. Also, there is the moral and ethical side. Being a liar, being a thief, being a sneak, they're bad. You might in some cases win, you might in some cases make money, but trust me, the people in your world will know never to trust you. And the most important thing in life is trust. Trust is the basis of love, of friendship, uh, of, of other people giving you responsibility. Trust is what makes real bonds between people. And if you're untrustworthy, your life will be blighted for it. Be honest and honorable. Don't sacrifice the trust I now have in you for some stupid few points on a stupid homework assignment or a silly exam at school. It's not worth it. Be true to yourself. Give yourself the gift of integrity. Um, personal electronic devices. When we have tests, you're not going to be allowed to wear, wear riskier during the test because some people are tempted by the idea of smart devices that can help them get the answers. Also, don't ever record me without my permission. Now, I have my classes recorded right now anyway. And if you want to record me, ask. And if it's a good reason or if I think it's fun, I'll probably give you my permission. But recording without my permission and then posting it is a violation of the law and it's a violation of my privacy. Here at school, we have certain protections. So I've seen too many bad YouTube videos of people recorded without their knowledge. I won't have it. I will defend myself legally and sue, if necessary, to the full extent of the law to protect my rights and the rights of other students and the rights the, of the integrity of this classroom. If you want to record me for a purpose, ask. I will take your request very seriously and try to find a way to say yes. But don't be sneaky. Again, that goes into the whole integrity thing. We're almost done. One more page. Um, so flip it. We're on item Roman numeral 17, classroom discipline. While you're here, this is a formal environment. This is a workplace. I will rule this classroom like an alpha wolf because if I don't, someone else will. Does that mean we can't have disagreements? Of course we can have disagreements. Does that mean we can't have uh, interesting and fun discussions? Of course we can have those. But it's my room. I'm going to enforce uh, what I think is reasonable standards so that we get the most out of our time together. Because if nothing else, this lovely virus has taught me how precious our time together really is. So, um, don't play around with the dance of discipline. Normally, that's a bad idea with me, but this year, it won't work. It really, it won't work for you or me, and we will quickly come to uh, something that's definitive. Snow days, bump everything, uh, all due dates back by one day. 
that are on the snow day itself. That's all. So if we have a chapter survey due Monday and that chapter survey is, uh, and that class on Monday is canceled because of snow, it's due Tuesday. If, on the other hand, there is an assignment due Wednesday of that week, the snow day won't affect it. It still will be due Wednesday. So on snow days, anything due on snow days is bumped back a day. Uh, the textbook we talked about, you should have it at home covered. You should not be bringing it to class. You should not be keeping it uncovered uh, because it's $150 value. And if it is damaged due to your problems, it will be uh, your family's responsibility to re reimburse us for the replacement costs of that book. Section 21 is everything you need to do on my homework. For example, uh, make sure your full name, first and last. Anyone who <clears throat> says, well, I'm the only Ziggy at school, I don't care. I want your first and last name on everything, every quiz, every test, every bit of homework. I take five percentage points off the top from everyone that doesn't put their first and last name. So do that. Use dark pencil lead. Use dark navy ink or dark uh, black ink. <clears throat> because I'm not going to even read sparkly pink pastel colors. It gives me a headache. I just won't grade it. I'll, say, I'll give it back to you and say redo it in something dark. Dark ink. And look at the other things I want from your homework. So, and we've talked about the movie policy. So that is it for all of the various uh, lessons. Now, what is the timestamp? I have no idea. Oh, it's 46 minutes in. Okay. Seniors, senior, I'm not sorry, uh, European history students, come back, come back, come back. And I will uh, tell them to fast forward to this point. You're going to see three video links. Two video links are from the movie Heat, which is a movie set around the year 2000 about armed bank robbery in Los Angeles. The other movie is 2001 A Space Odyssey a science fiction movie that starts out with a scene called The Dawn of Man. The 2001 A Space Odyssey scene is the before picture, before any of this history. The heat scene is the after picture, the picture of basically our modern society. Now, the scene from 2001 has violence at the end. Okay? So if you don't want to see the actual violence, at the second encounter by the well... When you see a guy with a club short charging at another guy, turn it off. You will have seen most of the, of, of, of the scene, and you can do your work based on that. The heat scenes in the second one, set in the, in the cafe, has some foul language. So try your best to deal with that. Because they're cop and criminal talking to one another in the language of the streets, which is a language that is salty. I suppose if the foul language really bothered you, you could see just the helicopter and highway scene from Heat and infer the rest. So what do I want you to do? Well, I'm also attaching a single page simple worksheet with five questions where you write uh, about what you saw in the opening scene of 2001 A Space Odyssey as compared to what you've seen in the movie Heat. It looks like this. The first question, what world were they born into? Describe the physical environment that they're in, in 2001 and in Heat. Question two, who are they? Describe the characters, their bodies, hygiene, and accoutrement. That's clothing and stuff like that. By the way, 2001 A Space Odyssey proceeds from an evolutionary biology model. You don't have to believe in it. Okay, you don't. If you are a Seventh-day creationist, what you can do is you can look at the ape men and, and just imagine, instead of ape men, that they're savage human beings. Because... Um, the Bible does reference people in a state of savagery. That's where we all start, start from. In any case, you describe the people that you see in the scenes. Uh, question three, what do they want? All good storytelling is about conflict. So what is the conflict about in 2001 A Space Odyssey? And what is the conflict about in Heat? What do they do? 
How do they intentionally and unintentionally act in order to achieve victory in their conflict? What do they do? What don't they do? Finally, question five, what decides the issue? Describe how the conflict is resolved, why it is decisive, and what the consequences that you can imagine are. All you have to do is do quick write-ups. These are due the next time you are in class. So be ready the next time you are in class with this written out and done and signed and ready to talk about and ready to turn in. So that's it. You see the three clips, one from 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is about 10 minutes long, uh, two clips from Heat, which together maybe are 10 minutes, probably less. And you do the write-up that is also attached. That's the assignment. That has to be done before you come into class next Tuesday or next Wednesday. Tuesday for B-Day students, next Wednesday for A-Day students. That's all she wrote. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have a happy and wondrous three-day weekend. And I love the fact that American Labor Day is not Communist Labor Day. Communist Labor Day is May 1st. This is not a May 1st Labor Day. It's for backyards and barbecues. Have a great weekend. See you next week.